Hi, welcome to today's episode of Vestibular Talks. Today's special guest is Camille. Camille is a successful professional, an independent woman, a very dedicated vestibular ambassador that is raising awareness about how these vestibular conditions impact our daily lives. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy the episode and find your happiness, guys. All right, Camille, welcome to this episode of Vestibular Talks. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to take it back. I'm slightly symptomatic, but I'm doing good. <laughs> and I appreciate you inviting me to speak with you today. Um, no, it's my pleasure. And then um, I understand what you mean symptomatic because a lot of days that are normal for us are not really normal. Like we, we, we have symptoms, but they are more manageable that are bad days right so uh, so i understand what you mean because sometimes you use you, you might seem normal and feel somewhat normal but the symptoms are kind of like always in the background like playing there maybe a, a, not as an intense feeling but they are always constantly ba back there yeah camille can you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh how your condition began sure well, I'm just turning 50, so that's a major milestone that I that I ju that just passed, and I was able to get out and celebrate it by going by going on a trip. I got on a plane after maybe seven or eight years of not flying, and I say that to say that was such a interesting and remarkable milestone for me because I came from a career of um, foreign policy, international development. So I was traveling all the time. I was traveling in and out of Africa for projects with different embassies, international meetings in Japan, um, London, Moscow, all, you know, all these types of interesting locations. And one fateful day, I was in my, in my bathroom and I had, I was doing my hair, I mean, my hair's not done now, but <laughs> I was doing my hair. I have a dog who came in and was looking for me. Uh, at the time, the dog was just very young. He's, he's about 15 years old now, but um, the dog came in looking for me and ran across my leg and kind of sat on my foot. And so I was doing my hair and while I was doing that, I opened the, uh, a, a glass cabinet to, pull something, I saw a hair product or something. And then I left the cabinet open and my dog was at my feet. So I bent over, touched my dog, she was okay. And when I lifted my head, that glass cabinet that was sitting open to slice me down. I probably had a gash or maybe like, like this thick. Blood was everywhere. I didn't feel yeah. any pain. I didn't feel any, I just felt the, the I just felt the, the pressure because the pressure of the impact in my jaw. So I'm like, my, my jawline was hurting, but I had no pain in my scalp. Yeah. Um, so blood was like all over the place. And I was kind of sitting there like, okay, what should I do? Should I call 911? This is not that big of a deal. I don't want to get through this, go through this issue with my insurance. Okay, you should have come to the urgent care. Why didn't you go to, I don't want to go through that. So I just, I just kind of just, I kept some blood on me because I went to urgent care and I wanted to show them this is serious. I don't want to get in line. So you better, you know, you better triage everybody else behind me because I'm bleeding from a hit. So they did take me immediately. I was stapled together. The doctor um, assessed me for, you know, blood loss. How was I feeling? And I didn't present with anything peculiar. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask me if I had a concussion, which is which, which is an issue that comes up later in my story. But I didn't present with any of those symptoms. So stitch me up, clean me up, off I go. So within about a year, I had some I had some minor irritation because you know how your skin heals and you know the stables came out. So the nerve endings were a little bit were bothering me. But the bigger problems 
arose when I started to drive and I drove to a Whole Foods in my neighborhood. I parked my car, got in the store, and when I came back and tried to back out of the parking space, I turned my head, you know, to park. Um, excuse me, I'm, I got to plug in. I'm sorry. Um, I turned my head back. Or I can pull out. And then once I turned my head forward, then everything was like, Woo! and so I didn't know what to do with that. So I just stood there with my eyes closed and said, and just maybe this is a bad something. Maybe I'm just, you know, tired, dehydrated, or whatever. So I sat in the back of my head, okay, there's one experience. I can, you know, chalk it up as a, just some weird happened. I'm going go about my day. Now, those, those instances kept happening. So when I was shopping <clears throat> in Target, Costco, um, I would have the, the most massive dizzy episodes and I was on the floor. And I felt like I, and I would probably look like I was like a crybaby because I just could not manage. I couldn't stay upright. I was getting nauseous. Thankfully, I didn't vomit where I was in public, but I couldn't do anything. So again, chalked it off. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not doing something. Maybe I'm nutritionally deficient. I don't know. And so these episodic dizzy spells were happening a few, like once a month, once every couple of months. But as time passed, they were like once a week, a couple of times a week, every day. And then that's when I started to, to sit back and say, something's really wrong with me because I don't know why I'm having these headaches, these dizzy spells, and I can't do anything and I can't. I can't drive anywhere and I can't walk anywhere without feeling triggered. So um, long story short, I went to my primary care physician, said I'm dizzy. We went through a bunch of tests. They wanted to, to check out any kind of brain abnormalities. Like, do you have MS? Do you have lupus? Do you have brain tumor? Something going on in your arteries? All those tests came back ne negative. Um, and then we then said, okay, I'm still having symptoms, so can you help me? Um, I had a couple of doctors say, you know, is it is it, it's an ang it's anxiety. <laughs> and um, I, I was just going to touch into that. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Camille. Yeah. People don't seem to understand that this is not anxiety, but this generates intense amounts of anxiety. It's, it's like it, because it's like the A to the B, it generates anxiety. Yes. Because when you're feeling dizzy and out of control, and you and you feel a sensation that is it's very uncomfortable and, and, and very hard hard to maneuver, yeah, your anxiety spikes. And as it spikes, the symptoms also increase. So it's like they they, they play ball with each other. So but many doctors chuck it off as saying, oh, well, you're just anxious. Well, well, yeah, I'm anxious, but I'm not anxious because of no reason. I'm anxious because of this. Right. And then it, and as, as my symptoms progressed, it was difficult for me to get out the bed. I mean, even sit, to sit upright, to get, you know, get out of the bed in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I'm on the floor crawling because I can't have, I, I don't have a sense of my spatial orientation, orientation yeah. when I'm vertical. You right. know, I'm at rest at horizontal, but when as soon as you sit up vertical, like what's happening, my brain just kind of like feel like it's shifting from one side to the other. Yes. So... Doctor visits, doctor visits, doctor visits. So I went to audiologists. I went to a um, couple of neurologists, a handful of emergency room visits. Um, I was like autologist uh, and a few other. They just kind of came up dry. Are you sure it's not in your head? Are you sure you're not having anxiety? I'm dizzy. I can't do anything. I. Every time I turn my head, I want to vomit. Every time I want to stand up, I want to vomit. Every time I drive and you know turn around, I want to. So how, what else do I need to tell you to take me seriously? And oh, yeah. I mean, and something that I read from your bio that I personally related a lot to is our eyes yes. can focus. I yes. couldn't watch TV for three years because my eyes couldn't follow the images I or a, or read a book. Like if I read a book. I would lose the lines because I would be in this paragraph and it's like my eyes couldn't track the second line underneath. So yeah, yeah. people don't understand that it's hard for us to function in a day to day basis because something as necessary as your eyesight 
it's hard for us to to control it and to okay. track it. Yes. And the I if I can issue, issue something into play in Texas one day, day I can go to I'm sorry. <laughs> so one day I went to a uh I went to a had a uh, a regular eye exam because I was having a lot of floaters in my eye and I was like, what are these things? You know, just get them out. What do I need to do? And that eye exam, I almost I almost vomited on my um my optometrist and she said, wait a minute, you're having some really serious issues. Maybe you can talk to my colleague that is that deals with neurological ocular situations. And so I finally met her. And then after a hectic eye exam that took about three sessions, and she had me, she had me chasing dots around the room and moving my head and doing all kinds of things. She did, she finally diagnosed me as someone that has post-concussion syndrome, um, vestibular ocular motor dysfunction, and um, abnormal spatial location orientation, excuse me. So that's where the eyepiece came in. It happened to be a, not a neurologist that said so. It was an optometrist who specialized in brain in brain injuries. So from there, I took I went out of my network, and I also wanted to get a second opinion with somebody that was. Um, and I'm I'm in the D.C. area, so Johns Hopkins is down the road. It's up in Baltimore, and I went to see somebody that was a neuro neuroautologist, who was somebody who specializes in the inner ear, inner ear diseases, and the balance center. So he seconded the diagnosis, but added the extra dimension of you have persistent, persistent postural perceptual dizziness. So with all these things in this big bowl, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. With my doctor, she was helping me for a little while, but then left their, left the practice in the HMO that I'm in. And then I was stuck. I was like, oh my God, what do I do? I don't know how to get, you're giving me a diagnosis, but what are my, what's my treatment what plan? Treatment? Nobody in and nobody in the in the um, in the HMO network was doing what she was doing, so I was left. And I wrote letters. I was like, I have an issue. She's got me a di give me a diagnosis. I can't work. I can't do anything. Um, so finally, I was like, enough is enough. I'm just gonna go on my own. So this particular neuro optometrist was a part of an organization called the Neuro Optometrist Rehab Association. At that same time, I was also researching other organizations that have that deal with brain and brain trauma, brain injury, head headache, and all that. So I went to Headache Foundation, this, that, and the third, and I then I uh, got to um, Vita, the Vestibular Disorders Association, and through Vita and through the Neuro Optometry Rehab Association, I was able to piece together what my issues are and how to move forward. It was unfortunate that I couldn't get that from a medical professional, but I had to do my own research because I was like, I can't, I can't do anything. And nobody's telling me anything. They're always looking at me like I had the problem of something going on in my, in my mental state. No, this is something physical that's happening. Yes. I can't put my finger on it. And then what I learned in this conversation with this newer optometrist and and um, others that were in her profession that I consulted with is that there's a difference between eyesight and vision. Eyesight is just me looking at you. I can see you. I'm 2020, you know, whatever, 20, 2015. But vision is how your brain processes the input that comes through your eyes. Right. And so if the input that's coming through your eyes is not Thinking up with the input that's coming through your balance system, and then it's not, it's mis they're misfiring, and yeah. then your somatic system is confused. It's like, what's going on? And so my body was in constant state of, I don't know which way I'm going. It, I couldn't process motion. So any, anything I looked at was, they had a bunch of squirrely lines. I got dizzy. Yeah. Um, in Costco, trying to reach for things. You know, and go, and then trying to, you know, go through in and out the the um the lane, the the, not the lanes. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, walkways, dizzy. Yes, and uh, and you're right. Anything that has many patterns, like yes. a carpet with patterns or or curtains with patterns, like it's, it's like your eyes can make sense of it. And uh, and sometimes, for my peripheral vision. I can almost see like things are vibrating and moving, even though I know I have to convince my brain and tell my brain, 
that chair right there is not moving. Yeah. But 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 from my eye, I see like the chair is moving, like either sliding or vibrating. So I, I have to I have to make conscious sense to my brain of what what's happening. And it's difficult to drive as well sometimes because uh like if if I come to a to a stop sign where the train tracks are there and the train is passing by all, all them same repetitive yeah. movement from the train, my eyes will go crazy. Like I they yeah. couldn't yeah. Or have you had this situation where you get a passenger in a car and you know they're braking suddenly and that an urge that keeps you moving forward, you break and you're going forward, and it's like that is so disorienting too. Is that yes? And that is, that was its main trigger. Um, I was in a car with my mom, and she, one day I felt like she was just not hitting all the notes um, in terms of <laughs> driving somewhere, and so just, people were just driving crazy. So it was a constant like. And I was like, Mom, stop! It's like killing me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I, I know, I know, and 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 it's uh, and that sensation that pe people feel it every day. That when, well, not every day, but they feel it often. That when you you park in a spot and the car next to you moves, you feel like your your car is the one moving. <laughs> we feel that a lot more than than regular people. That like people feel it every now and then. For us, I I always step on the brake. When I say, feel the sensation, but I, I have to tell my mind, it's it's my brain, you yeah, know, making yeah. sense of, of, of what's happening right. around me. I stopped driving. I haven't been behind the wheel in about four years, four or five years, because I'm concerned about that that knee jerk reflex action where you gotta, you know, you know, see something, and I don't want to trigger. I can do it right now because I'm actually on medication. My brain is my neural pathways are suppressed so I can kind of demonstrate like if you drive and you're like oh my god no, I can't run the risk of coming back from a head jerk and then all the stuff everything's going crazy and then you middle of the street and you don't know where you you know how to get out of it so I start driving and that's a little bit of an issue because Uber's Uber's expensive <laughs> well I can't I mean, set up friends to pick me up and go everywhere but Uber's expensive so that's one that's one of the questions that I had for you is the fact that the financial aspect or financial burden of any any sickness, any disease, any condition, any medical condition, the financial burden is very hard. Yeah. I personally have spent, if I had to guesstimate right now, probably about forty-eight to fifty thousand dollars in different treatments. Yes. I'm blessed that in Canada, major things like surgeries or or seeing a specialist are covered by our health system. However, other things like vision therapy, it cost me four thousand uh, dollars. It wasn't covered by my insurance or by the government, so I had to pay out of pocket for that. Uh, chiropractor, uh, vestibular physiotherapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, all those things come out of pocket. So, in order for us to to in, in that desperation of us wanting to get better we we do anything we'll we'll, we'll literally do anything i i've gone that i i want to do because not everybody has that kind of dogged pursuit of the truth about what i'm going some people sit in it and could because perhaps they're not in an area where there's a lot of specialists or, but i'm in a, i'm in the dc area there's five or six medical schools it's a Ton of doctors, mm -hmm. medical, but like I can imagine somebody that's in a rural area, who there may be one doctor, maybe one neurologist, and they're dealing with all of these, the, you know, spinning sensations and dizzy sensations, and they don't know what to do. So I, that's when I would say to anyone that's out there, is listen to this. If you don't have doctors that are in your wheelhouse or in your orbit, then start reaching out to these um, advocacy organizations, and they can link you up with some people. But what you're saying is very true, was also very true for me because I went out a network of my HMO. I mean, in the US, I'm not even gonna get to how bad the healthcare system is. I mean, it's good in the sense that there's innovation, it's good in the sense of there's um, doctors, the number of doctors per 1,000 people or 10,000 people is very high. The problem is, it's just getting access to that and then getting coverage and, and getting those coverage decisions to be able to get to the doctor and get the treatments that you need. So I went out, I, I'm in an you know, HMO, health maintenance organization. It's all there. It's one stop shop for everything. I go in, pharmacy, x-ray, everything's all in one, one, one place. 
But when I needed treatment that was not in their, in that, that was not provided by a provider within the specialty of vestibular disorders or neurooptometry, I had to go out to get the therapy. Went to a vision therapy expert. Went, I went to um, the Dr. Bryce. Shout out to him, who um, gave me a gave me a very thorough evaluation that blew, that blew me away. I didn't know how bad it was, um, but that was $150 a session. And they were saying, you know, two to six times a week, you need to do something. And is it two, two, two times a week at $150 or $300? If I want to increase it to get better faster, that means I add another session that week. There, and then there was homework. And in that, I spent a good seven months. I probably spent like $6,000 out of my pocket. And then I went back to my HMO to ask for reimbursement. And then they said, oh, no, um, you didn't do the right processes. And you didn't check with this neurologist. And this, the, I was like, you people didn't even have this, have someone who could give me a treatment plan. Nobody gave me a treatment plan. So I had to go on my own. So what am I supposed to do? And so I never got the $6,000 <laughs> back. And I said, I'm just going to let it, I'm just going to let it go out and watch because I had, I decided to pursue an, um, an appeal, I would have had to pay the lawyer the six thousand dollars. So, yeah. another very important thing that you mentioned, Camille, is the fact that um, many doctors chalk this out as, "Oh, you're anxious, it's anxiety, or you have a mental problem, or you have some sort of a uh, of hypochon type hypochondria, something when you yeah, have hypochondria." Yeah. So, um, they they chalk it to that and. I don't know if it's the lack of conscience or the lack of information or the lack of resources, but many people, many people that I've met live busy lives and many of them are undiagnosed. They just, they just, like you said, that sometimes they live in rural areas or they live in areas where there are not specialists, busy specialists. So these people are like, well, I've been busy for the last 10 years and, you know, like it's just, you, they just kind of like, they just kind of accept it. They're like, oh, I'm, I've just been busy and, and my life's a busy life. How do you feel that people can get access or better access to for because for example, you had to advocate for yourself. People were telling you, doctors were telling you, oh, you're just busy because you're anxious. But you you didn't you didn't take that as a, as an answer. You said, no, I know I have something physical going on with me, and I'm going to find an answer. I'm going to find a treatment. I'm going to find a cure. What's your advice for people that kind of given up because they don't have the resources, the money? The doctors, like, what would you like to tell them? <laughs> you don't have to sit in an existence of suffering and discomfort. That is not why we are here. <laughs> it's not why we are human beings. We have to be well to fit the purpose that we that we were made for. And if you are in a situation where it's you come up against the wall and you're in a, in an area where there is no one that can help, get, help help you figure out what's um, wrong with you, then they got to get moving and pursue the truth. Because doctors don't even know everything themselves. Since when, I can't, I can't, when you look back in the past 10 years, I don't remember anything in the public discourse about vestibular disorders mm -hmm. or chronic dizziness. So this is something that the advocacy groups get together. So you really got to get, on board with first going on the internet, going to social media, because there's Reddit groups, there's going Quora, Facebook groups, just type in dizziness support groups. Go in and see what people are talking about, see what people are saying about this is what I did to have to, to um, exist in my space. This is what I'm doing to cope until I get, get some real information that can help me on my wellness journey. Start there, and then once you start there, that can give you some ideas. Then move to all the advocacy organizations. Type in dizziness, dizziness disorders, and you'll probably find VITA. Then you probably find um, Traumatic Brain Injury Association. Get on those uh, those newsletter lists, email list. Wait for the information, and then also a lot of these advocacy organizations have referral lists. So it's just it's no harm in, in looking at this referral list and finding the person that's closest to you. Even if it's 15 miles away from you in the next state, it's no harm in giving them a call and say, can you help me? Can, can I have a consultation? 
consultation shouldn't, I mean, if, if, if doctors are really interested in helping people with rare or interesting or kind of weird disorders and conditions, and they're in the, in that mix, I think they will be more willing to have at least a phone conversation to consult 15 minutes, and then they can give you some direction. Yeah. Lastly, I would say any university that is teaching medicine could be also a resource. Yeah. You know, just check and see who check and see in the neurology department who's there, what they're doing. They they have like special clinics. They may have a special research programs or whatever. Just you need to start collecting names and get all this together um, so that you'd be able to, you know, sit back in it and reflect on what's my next step. The other thing, and that's just gathering information. The next thing I, could, I, I think is um, having a sense of what your medical coverage is going to look like. Because, yeah, you can find the greatest treatment, but if your medical coverage is not going to meet you in the middle and cover that, then, what you know, you might be stuck. So get through, go through your medical coverage, get clear about the benefits that are given to you, get clear about exclusions, and then those, that information can also be a part of your consultation consultation conversation. Say, I don't have this, that, and the third in coverage. What do you suggest? Can I see you? What what can I do? There might be some way. Some people are willing to bend, yeah. but you can't have them bend for you until you present the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Camille, something that you mentioned earlier, which I'm a big advocate of, is um, and it's weird because at the beginning, okay. So you said earlier that people should go into these forums and these social media groups. It is good. However, you have to filter the information because yes. there are people there with very, very dark stories that make you feel worse about your condition. So you have to filter that. At the beginning, when I was looking for information, people wrote horrible stories about medication. Oh, I started with this medication and he gave me this and that side effects. He made me worse. He made me this. So at the beginning, I was against medication. Mm -hmm. Actually, after talking to a lot of professional doctors, they convinced me to try medication. And it was the best thing I've ever did because, like you said, medication allows me to, to function in a more normal state. Yes, the symptoms are always in the background, but I'm able to drive, to work, to travel, to, to live a more normal life. A lot of people that approach me on social media, they say, hey, you know, we see you playing basketball, we see you riding bicycles, we see you traveling. Like, what's the secret? And I said, there is no real secret. It's just medication is me being stubborn and not just feeling sorry for myself, but also going out there and trying to live the best life I can live. It's also clean diet. It's also exercise, therapy. But as soon as I say the word medication, they shut down. They're like, no, I don't want medication. I don't want medication. Medication is toxic. Medication is medication. And I'm like, listen, I, I understand that medication has certain side effects, but not all medications are bad. And I'm living proof that medication has helped me. And many other people out there are living proof that medication allowed them to claim their lives back. How was it for you, Camille? Was it an easy decision taking medication? And how, what were the changes prior to taking medication and after taking medication? It was easy because I was given my particular medication after an emergency room visit while I was in observation. Um, I went in complaining about dizziness and vomiting. I thought I was having a stroke. And I was uh, up in arms. I was like, somebody tell me my head is about to fall off. I don't want to like end up brain. Somebody tell me what's going on with my brain. Um, so it was just, it just so happens that there was just one person that said, okay, let me get you to calm down and perhaps this will help some of your overstimulation. I don't know what, where this came from, what her primary reference was, but she gave me uh, lorazepam, Ativan, which is a, I also have heard of clonopin come up in conversations as well. But I, I, she, I was like, just give me something. Cause I can't, I, I don't, I can't walk straight. Give me something. So she I took the pills and I was there for observation overnight. And I just, I sat up and I was like, wow. 
you know, no. I'm not feeling this yet. This is the this is the, the this is the golden ticket here. It's like okay. <laughs> so um, after I went to uh, the observation, got off the observation, I was discharged, and I went to primary care, uh, a primary care physician. Um, they said, well, perhaps you have a vestibular migraine. Um, because this, if you are responding to Ativan with dizziness, then let's take it a little bit th- further. Maybe you have a vest. And so that's when the word vestibular started to, to ring in my head. And that's where we started to, to chase that word into finding resources. And that led us to Vita, that led us to other doctors and so on and so forth. I had no issue. I was like, give me something because this, where I'm sitting now is the pits. I felt like, I felt like, um, not being able to lift my head. I mean, I was sitting in the in the uh, emergency room on the bed, just kind of like, I can't lift my head because I'm going to throw up you, you know, people. Mm-hmm. So they didn't know what was wrong with me. They didn't have a diagnosis, but at least they had some frame of reference of of dizziness and how that plays out in people. And um, they, they had, at the time, didn't know if I was truly having a stroke or if I was having a heart issue or something like that. So... It just so happens that that was just what was given to me at the time. And that was the, the thing that sort of um, set me in the right direction in terms of, and I still take Ativan. I, I take it twice a day mm-hmm. as needed, not every day. It's sometimes, you may, as you may experience, diz- dizziness is at varying levels of intensity. Mm-hmm. I have it at least every day. Mm-hmm. It, it could start I mean, me just getting out of the bed in the morning if I get up too fast. I mean, I, I went to a therapy session and, one of the therapists said, you just don't just sit up. You just got to twist and turn and leg. And I have this whole routine. routine to get out of the bed, but I don't follow it because it's not it's not habitual yet. Um, so I did a I did a um, a YouTube um, video just explaining my symptoms and what the initial assessment was and what the initial diagnosis was and just how I deal with every day. And I said. The medication is what's saving me right now until I can get a better feel for how therapy can fix everything. Because I don't expect to be on, on medication for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, this is gonna it's, this is what's necessary for me to, to be able to do something. I'm not at the I'm not at the I'm not at where you are. I, I'm not driving yet. Um, I can read, but maybe two or three pages in a sitting. I'm only doing maybe one or two cognitive tasks a day. I'm still, I'm not working. Um, and I was able to parlay all this information and is able to get um, disability insurance, social security disability, you know, in the US system, you, all the years you work, you pay it, pay FICA dues <laughs> to the system. And so you're paying FICA, so you should be able to get something back. So I was, was awarded disability because you, you know, being on the phone, I can't do this. I can't be on the, you know, doing this. And because the eye gaze and the eye teaming issues are not there, the, the, the um, convergence of the ocular and the vestibular still doesn't work. Um, I could sit and maybe look at a movie and then turn my turn around and get up and then I'm on the floor. So I never know when the symptoms appear. Sometimes I can work them through because I'm so used to them now, but I shouldn't have to. No one should have to work it through. Um, But it's just that it's it's just that this particular disorder is not in the public discourse as it should be. And perhaps that's, you know, why you and I are connected to Vita to try to get the word out there because it's it's millions of people dealing with dizziness from all different reasons. I had a head hit. Somebody had maybe have had Dizziness as, as it relates to um, car accident, mm-hmm. or they may have had a stroke, or I mean, yeah. so yeah. it's just like a chronic condition that seems to be shrugged off as, oh, maybe you, maybe you, you know, got out too fast, and maybe you're hypertensive, or maybe you, you know, you might know, like we talked about, you know, mental health, anxiety, but no, there's some, there's some actually biological, biochemical things going on. And not going on <laughs> for us to feel this way. So yeah. I'm just not willing to sit and and let it happen. I mean, for a while I did because I was like, oh, well, it was me. But then, like again, like I said earlier, you gotta grieve that process. Like I'm different now. Yeah, come here. 
Mm. Now that you mentioned the disability, how difficult or how complex is it to navigate that process for someone that wants to apply for it? For example, when this first started for me, for almost a year, I couldn't really function no normally. So I, I try applying for disability here in Canada. Mm. The neurologist basically discouraged me because he said this condition as itself, because you have vestibular migraines, PPPD, and, um, and potentially concussion, uh, traumatic brain injury, doesn't really fill the criteria. It doesn't really fit the criteria for disability. So he said it's going to be very difficult to put a case forward. So thankfully, glory to God and to the medication that I'm taking and to me being stubborn and doing everything that I do, I've been able to roll back on into working and doing everything else. But how difficult was it for you to, to navigate the disability process? It was very difficult and that satisfied my patients. Um, and I think for the U.S., the Social Security Disability System, it's predicated on people applying and get it weeded out. They want to make it difficult for you because they don't want to make it widely available because anybody can have any kind of reason why they don't want to work. But the main question is, does your condition affect your ability to work? And how long do you think that condition will persist and not allowing you to work? So I went through the major, it was an application. It was, application was like this thick. Uh, and I could, at the time, I couldn't read, could barely type. So my mother had to sit and type this all this out while I was talking it through. They want to get your medical history uh, 10 years back. They want to they wanna get um, uh, where you worked, how long you've worked, what kind of work you did. Um, and that's the first stage of an application that goes in. They're going to automatically reject you because they have what's called um, listings. They have diseases and disorders that are that are automatically given the thumbs up um some maybe something like a brain tumor breast cancer there's some things that are standard that are automatically given the thumbs up but when you talk about a vestibular condition nobody knows anything about that too yeah. much so i'm going through this process and talking about i'm dizzy 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 um vestibular i can't i'm i'm, I'm tilting i see things crooked things don't i'm always spinning around vertigo they're they look at it and say, OK, well, you can get straightened out some other kind of way. So I kept pushing and kept pushing. And then what I decided to do is to, to go back to these specialists. I said, I need something in writing to describe where my deficits are and how my deficits will affect my well-being and how my deficits will affect me being able to work. So I had um, I went to one professional that said, you know, you've got eye teaming problems, you have eye focusing problems. You, you know, you, you're not, your peripheral and your peripheral and your central focus and not converging properly. They gave all the scientific and they said, if you want to check this out, here's the scientific journal and here's the binocular um, dysfunction. They gave the scientific sites for, you know, this stuff is not in this listings. Deny it again. And so when I got to the point where I was preparing to meet for the judge, what I decided to do is to journal the to journal things and I use an app to journal things because you I could be talking to you and you saying I've been dizzy for six years that is not telling a judge anything but what I did is I submitted him a journal saying okay on August 1st I was dizzy at four o'clock it lasted for uh two hours I did this I did that to try to cope I had to lay down August 2nd, I was dizzy for half an hour. August 3rd, so I was very um, particular and specific about how I was feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. So that created a narrative that is that is more specific and more in-depth than saying, I'm dizzy for, for six years, I can't work. I'm sharing with him in an app. And so the app is timestamped. So it's not like I can sit, it's not like me sending up, giving a piece of paper saying, hey, I'm in disease a thing. It was timestamped and it was during in this particular app, I think it's called Migraine Buddy. Um, and I just I was meticulous about that. And so given the diagnosis, given the specialists that describe my condition and, and how I'm deficient, um, and using the um supporting documentation with Vita's materials, 
um, and my, I think it was like four or five months while, while I got rejected the first go, I spent four or five months just chronicling everything that was happening to me. <coughs> that was the story that helped sort of them turn the corner. I can say that if I had it my way, I would love to have the Social Security Administration start listing vestibular disorders in their list and so it's not, so it's automatic, yes. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to go through two and a half years of waiting to see and, have, and then you appear for a judge. And my judge happened to be sympathetic. Um, and it was also with the way I presented it and the way my lawyer coached me to present it in, in, in such a way. And then even my coach challenged the, um, the state on that, say, you know, well, she's having these issues. Can you accept her leaving or not being able to come work two or three times a week because she can't get out of bed? And that was a turning point in the discussion. It's like, you know, just like if you can't get out of bed two times a week, two or three times a week, then you can't technically be a reliable employee. So maybe what should give you the benefit of the doubt. So um, just being prepared with all the specifics, every medication you've taken, all the doctors you've seen, all of your ailments, regardless of whether it's related to vestibular issues, dizziness issues, everything. It's just about paperwork and it's a ton of it. Each state is different. I'm in the state of Maryland. They're very generous with, um, Social Security disability, but it's still a process, and it did take it take a it took a long time. Just I just had to be very meticulous about how I how I archived and chronicled my journey, chronicled my triggers, chronicled my ailments, chronicled my pain, and then that helped the lawyer create a narrative about you know this this girl needs some help. She may not be able to stay at our job for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Cause you know, Americans, we work like 10 hours a day. <laughs> right now I can only do like two. <laughs> and that's something that you and I discussed before we started recording. Yeah. That one of the most difficult aspects of this is losing your independence. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, according to your biography, you told me, and I, and I can see that like you, you were a successful woman. You are a successful woman. Yeah. You, you're professional, you're educated. You are a go-getter like you, you're not someone that says, well, I just don't want to work because I'm lazy. No, you're someone that built a life. Yes, you built a life and in, in, in a quality of life based on, on hard work, on, on hard effort, on, on education. So when, when this hits you and you have to basically kind of like give up your career, give up being independent, it, it takes a toll mentally, emotionally, and physically on you because... Yes. One thing I would say about the the what one thing I left out of the, the disability um, points I was making was that the judge looks at you in your career path and what you were doing the last time before your disability appeared. So I was in a job that required me to read cases or read memos, write memos, do research. And so they looked at that and saying, you know, well, if you're dizzy, you can't read and you want to vomit every other day, then perhaps that. So in my, so a lot of times it does have to, it has to do with how the dizziness affects your ability to work, but also what kind of job you had prior to the disability, the onset of the disability. So that may be a turning point. So, so like if you were working in, um, and it's unfortunate they do pass judgment on it. If you were a cashier at a cafe, uh, may have not, and, and they presented the same inf information in the same way, but yeah, I was a, an attorney and I was working for a policy and I was writing memos, was his, you know, I was doing stuff for ambassadors and stuff. They probably would look, give more favorability to me because the, 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 the change was such drastic. I can't read, I can't read but two pages, but before I would sit 10 hours and write speeches and read 100 yeah. pages and do a class. So they would, you know, they would make past judgment based on that. It's unfortunate they do that yeah. um, based on, the, based on the, the type of job you had and the type of skills that you use. But if you can no longer engage in those skills because of your deficiency, then, then that. But to answer your question about which was <laughs> I'm always talking the, the, the loss of independence. You about the um what did you do you, you were saying I was saying the loss of independence that oh, loss of independence oh yeah because 
One of the things that bothers me so much is that, I mean, because I don't drive, the the loss of independence will comes in a couple of ways. One is the freedom to do whatever I want to do because my my income and my um this you know but my disposable income um salary income and you know income from investments and stuff, it just I say I'm like net zero net worth <laughs> because I depleted everything I had to be able to exist do a little bit of something here and there, um, pay some bills. And then I had to, you know, I'm living with my mother now who's almost 80 years old. And so I have to, a lot to rely on her because I don't drive. She likes to drive, um, but I feel bad because I should be taking care of her instead of her taking care of me. So that's a, that's a dependency issue that I grapple with on a regular basis. Like I'm really 50 years old and I should be, showering my mother with gifts and trips and things like that because she's done wonderful things for me but sometimes i can't walk across the, <laughs> oh. walk across the room and she's like mom don't get me i can't get out or, or, or i'm sitting somewhere i can't get up or you know taking a bath or wash i can't get out you know i shouldn't have to rely on um my mom and even if i relied on others they're not necessarily going to be ready, willing, and able at the time you need them. So I do have a squad of friends that are reasonably reliable, but I don't ask them for much because they have their own lives to deal with. You don't wanna, you don't wanna bother anybody. Else. Bother them. And they really come, their help really comes into play when we are together. Let's say we schedule an outing or dinner or something like that. So they know if I'm in a busy environment, I may have to come in there with my patch on my eye. You know, I wear a patch and sunglasses sometimes if I need to, a so monocular to be able to make sense of the environment. Um, or they need to assist me to walk across the street. I mean, this is little things like that, but I can't ask them to take me to a doctor's appointment because um, they have their, their work or their jobs or they. Um, and then when during and during this the COVID pandemic, I, nobody was going anywhere so I was that was that was time that I took to try to do some more research about different things and different possibilities and in in thinking about disability like I can't be on disability forever so what kinds of jobs could I do if I get to a point um where I can function for more than um a couple of hours in front of a computer or whatever so I'm still thinking about that now because I don't expect to be on disability that long because I'm probably going to be up for a review soon and ask me like what have you been doing what can you do what can't you do but i think at the end of the day like i really need to get busy with my therapy full force and that's an issue that's directly related to coverage decisions and I, i'm in the process of fighting my not fighting but really moving through the bureaucracy of my healthcare plan to say okay i have a specific condition that not many patients present within your organization. There are resources outside the network that can help me. So what can you do for me? Yes, before I went out on my own, I didn't get permission, but now I'm on disability. I have Medicare benefits. Um, you can't say no. So how are we going to do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know what? You're, you're right, Camille. It's unfortunate that sometimes they they want you, the insurance companies want you to go through them. But when you go through them, it's easy for them to dismiss you or to just say no, because uh, there's a new medication that is like an injection once a month that apparently decreases the intensity of the migraines and the frequency, yeah. as well as it has been proven that it decreases the dizziness. And I applied through my insurance company and they said no. So my neurologist sent a case in that case, he put all the documentation together. He said, you know, this guy needs it. Like he 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 will be able to to improve drastically if given this medication. And they again said no. They are like no. And uh, so it's hard because sometimes, you know, they, there could be hope out there for us, but due to certain limitations and bureaucracies and difficulties, our insurance companies don't approve or don't qualify us for something that could potentially change our life for the better. 
And that's a good thing that you mentioned because that goes back to what I was saying about learning your learning the bureaucracy of your healthcare plan and being clear about the benefits and, and um, um, benefits and exclusions because there might be a workaround somewhere. You might have to cite the benefit that connects. Instead of you saying, I have, let me back up. Let me say, instead of you saying, I've got dizziness, da, 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 you might be able to say, I've got dizziness, which is um, covered because I can get physical therapy, occupational therapy, blah, 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 blah. That's something specific in the cover, the benefit statement that if somebody tells you you have dizziness and you got to go to vestibular therapy, oh, but, and they don't know what vestibular therapy is, then vestibular therapy is essentially occupational therapy. It's physical therapy. It's this, so you have to kind of mesh together Layer what on. you need and put it in their language and see what you can have. But I will also say, if they denied you again, keep going because there still should be an appeals process. And unfortunately, if you have to get a lawyer involved, I would do it because you need to get what you get. Because I think it's, like I said, it's a game for these people. They are trying to not cover everything and, and it's unfortunate, but if they see you put up a fight, then they're probably more willing to help you out. Because what they what they don't want to have happen is you going through a process of denial and denial, denial and then all of a sudden you say, okay, I'm going to go to the public with this, or or your lawyer decides to go public, and then that brings bad PR on the healthcare plan. So they're just trying, they're just messing with you, you know, weeding you out. How bad do you want it? <laughs> well, it's yeah, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. What does, yeah. what does the future hold for Camille? Um, well, let me see. Like, as I look forward, I'm kind of looking at my current situation now, and as I've learned to, I learned I learned acceptance that the situation is with me for the short, medium, and perhaps the long term. I have no idea if it's permanent, but the goal is for it not to be. Um, I decided to, again, like I, I, I decided to grieve my former self. That's past. Now I'm in about empowerment and moving forward. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of things that I don't know about what my future holds because, again, it's like, what if I have to go back to work? What can I do with these limitations? I don't think the limitations would, in my mind, I may be. Fully cured, but I don't think the limitations will fully go away. So I will be sufficient in something. I definitely cannot work at the stamina and the intensity that I worked before I had my accident. That is clear. So what is that? What is what can I do now that will at least allow me to give my all? I've been trained. I've had all this training, but I want to give it to something. So what I thought of is I've looked at. Um, a couple of issues, a couple of uh, groups of friends of mine that are in some entrepreneurial pursuits, and I decided to to jump on board. I have equity interest in them, and I, what I if, when I can, I offer uh, strategic advice, or um, I may do some slides here and there. However, you know, for pitch presentation, um, I'm the idea. I'm a very good idea person. Um, I thought about if. If when this kid is subside or I go into remission, that like what kind of advocacy work I can do for people mm -hmm. who don't have insurance. Um, maybe that's my new calling per se. Like again, like I was saying in the very beginning, is it's you know, you may be different, but you still have a purpose. Purpose may be adjusted to your new reality. So I'm gonna walk into that right now. And this is this conversation I'm having is a part of that. And this is sort of a, the, the beginning stages when um, Cynthia called you about me. This is me in the beginning stage of being able to accept that. That may be something I could talk to, people I can talk to, um, things I could say, because I have a, um, a legally trained mind. So I can, you know, although I can't read much, I could still listen to, yeah. you know, documents and listen to reports and things like that. And I'm also very worried about my retirement. So, um, so I'm still kind of playing around with that, and I may get back into trading because I was doing some day trading for a little bit. Um, so I may get back into that. But again, it's it's contingent on me being able to sit and watch the screen because <laughs> I can't see myself day trading, and I'm got all these you know moving average and all these 
you know, you know those things, the, the oh, candles God. and all. I can't. And right not right now, but it, retirement is a scary piece. I mean, being 50 and I just got my a AARP card. <laughs> <laughs> discount. But 50 is not necessarily senior citizen yet, but they no, no, it's no. still it's in that direction. You know, my body's different. Um, I need to, you know, you talked about nutrition and fitness. I can't do a lot now because of head movements, but I decided I'm going to get a rower. So at least if I'm having a problem, I get dizzy. I'm already close to the floor. I'm not going to do a bike or Peloton or any of that or uh, elliptical because I don't, I don't want to run the risk of falling over. So a rower, I can just kind of get some exercise yeah. in. Um, I may go back into the pool, but that might be a problem because of the waves. Um, but I have, to, I have to test that out. I don't think, I went into a friend's pool to test out my ability to, to kind of sense the waters and the waves. I didn't fare too well, but I'm thinking about that in the future, but it may not be something I can do right now. It's, it's, the pool is doable. The weird one is the ocean. Although I, I oh, okay. I'm, okay, I'm okay with it now, but it, it, it was an adjustment process. The ocean was, was deep because of the waves. Yeah, and you're like, you know, you come, yeah. after you come out of the water, after you walk out, you, you still feel like you're in the waves. Right. You feel like that sensation right. inside, yeah. It, it was weird. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think the future too is just me being more confident in my body for what it, what it can do right now, even though it's limited, because back when this all first started, I was very concerned about how I look to other people because I, you know, like, I think you and I both have the dizziness that's kind of like drunkenness, like the uneasiness. I didn't have the spinning vertigo that some people have. I don't know if people with vestibular disorders have spinning vertigo. I'm not sure, but that may, that may be a case that's, for some that's people. That's more of many years. I, mean, I, I had yeah, a couple of times. years, yeah. I have a couple of times, but mine is, is like yours, is instability every day. It's like I got off a roller coaster ride and I kept feeling like I was moving. So I was feeling like I was walking weird. I was like, I didn't want people thinking I was drunk. I mean, because I that was the that was the feeling that I could most associate with yes. the dizziness and the nausea I was feeling. So um, I was concerned about my appearance, but I think after the past few years, I've been able to compensate in different ways with the medication, compensate with just sheer willpower and just the, the, the just the, the fact that time has passed and I've gotten used to things. It's very tiring. And that thing's that's one thing that we didn't talk about is the brain fatigue when you're trying to do enough to try to stay straight and you're trying to do enough to keep moving and keep your brain um, stimulated and trying to go out with friends and do, like there are times when my fatigue hits hard and I'm less like I can't I can't even blink without feeling like <laughs> feeling like um a ton of bricks just hit me because yeah, um, yeah. their brain is overworking so I'm I'm trying to figure out like what are my trigger points can what what are the things that I can do to, to avoid a dizzy spell while doing some while socializing um realizing there's environments that I can go in, there's environments that I should avoid. So that kind of awareness toward the future is like just me dealing with my environment and how I sit in that environment, notwithstanding that I have treatment that I need to get. And then while that treatment gets to gets me to a point of normalcy, I still have to manage things on my own based on what I'm feeling in that moment. So it's just the kind of thing like everything is just uncertain because the dizziness is different every day. Mm -hmm. every day I can't move. I mean, I, and there are days I don't want to move. There are days where I'm like, hey, let's go. You know, um, I went to a concert <laughs> on my 50th, when went to, on a travel on my 50th birthday. It was a mess trying to navigate the, the airport. You know, I got the disability oh. assistance and everything. Uh, the plane ride was not was okay. It's just the getting from gate to gate to gate past security. That's where all this was happening. So I was like, put me in this wheelchair. I can't do it. So I got, I was able to, to, to take care of that. Yeah. But I would like to, you know, to, to answer your question about the future, I would like to do some more traveling just to kind of get out of the house. We've been stuck here for a couple of years from pandemic. Also stuck because we have limitations. Um, yes, I've had some therapy. I need more, but I'm at a more confident state that I could do a road trip or two, just to change my yeah. scenery. 
may not be able to do the airplane thing, everything. Definitely can't do on a, a cruise ship or anything, but just change yeah. scenery. Oh, just, no, no cruise ship, no cruise ship. No, no. 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 Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, no. yeah, that's that's basically it's just it's 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 uncertain for me, but I'm just trying to pick at little yeah. ideas, things, and one thing at a time. It's good. Yeah, it's good, Camille. I like it. Uh, my last question for you is. This channel is called Find Your Chappiness, which is a play on words and find your happiness. Mm -hmm. How does Camille find her chappiness? Find my chappiness is, is, I mean, I like comedy. I like stand up comedy. I like laughing. I like being with my friends and laughing, eating with them. I have a, um, uh, a property my family has a property where i where i invite friends over because i can't go out to all the parties and things like that because of the the noise and the environment so i said to the party i bring the party to me so i have a nice little get togethers with a wine tasting or dinner or something so i'm happy when when i'm with friends that understand <laughs> and are willing to um deal with my limitations and still notwithstanding still be my friend and still be supportive so i do little things like that and then you know again la i love laughing so i've gone to comedy clubs just to laugh because sometimes you have to laugh at yourself yeah. <laughs> laugh at other people um and then just you know i just i'm prayerful i mean thank god it's this and again it's not not to rank order the catastrophe is i thank god is i'm dealing with this and not something more you know i'm grateful that i can get up out the bed even though it's a struggle even though it's even though it's 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 frustrating, even though getting myself together to leave the house is dizzying sometimes, but at least I can do it. So I have to have to celebrate the small victories. Yes. Yeah, um, and then acknowledge that. Yes, and continue to acknowledge. Yes, you're limited, but again, that limitation does not cancel out your purpose. So I'm in the process of redefining what my purpose is. So that's those are the types of things that. Make me happy. <laughs> um, you said laughing multiple times, and it's very true because, as we mentioned earlier, the anxiety that this creates, it puts your, you know, your nervous system has sympathetic response and parasympathetic. Yeah. Your sympathetic is your fight or flight or fear. Yeah. So early on, I started thinking, what's a way to bring that down? Mm -hmm. So I started listening to comedies in, in, in uh, on Spotify or in mm -hmm. YouTube. I'll find, I'll find comedies and I'll just play them. Mm -hmm. And I started laughing. I will laugh and laugh and laugh for hours. And that started keeping me more relaxed, more more calm, more. It started bringing that sympathetic nervous system response down to a more parasympathetic, where is where you allow your body to start recovering. So very good advice, Camille. Very good point. There there are studies about laughter. I don't I haven't read them, but I've seen them. I've seen them mentioned in things in the internet. There are studies about laughter and wellness. That, that there's a direct correlation between the more you laugh and the more you the more you find things funny that it disarm it disarms the tension, and then then you can get to the healing a, a, a bit better. Even, even as extreme as people with terminal cancers. Mm -hmm. that Laughter makes them feel better. No, it's not a miracle, magic cure, yeah. but it but it allows them to to feel less pain, to feel less less symptoms. So so laughter is a good one. You mentioned earlier that you have a dog that is 15 years old now. Yeah, he makes me happy too. Oh my gosh! Is that, is I was like, I'm gonna bring him. Can I bring him? Am I gonna take him? I want to bring him. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. He is 15 years old. He is the boss of the house. He is amazing. Right. His, his, when he has water, it has to be, I mean, every time he goes to the bowl for water, it has to be brand new water out of the, out the faucet with ice. 
his food has to be a certain way, you know, just everything. So he's just in there. He, I just want to know. Very cute. He, very, makes, very cute. he laughs because it's hysterical how much my boss he tries to do of me. And <laughs> They are they are such amazing creatures. They are such good companions. Yes. Yeah. And I thought about at one point, you know, we're we're running low on time. I thought about at one point whether I needed um a support animal or whether to be trained. And then there's some people who 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 are who are wearing weighted vests. So yeah. I looked at those options too. And this is some this is a separate conversation about treatment options, but I thought about perhaps having him learn to be a support animal, but he is too, he is too grudging. He was like, just don't touch me. I don't want, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to help you. As long as I'm getting the food and the water at the time that I want, I'm okay. Outside of that, him being 15, he's still <laughs> right. And then he's a night crawl and he's, he's up all night. So I don't get enough sleep. Yeah, very cute. I have, uh, I have, I have four. But these two that I showed you are the ones that follow me everywhere. The yeah. other two are in the living room doing their own thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's he's he's helpful. He's, he does he makes me laugh because he does stupid stuff and it's just you know it's like oh no, no, why do I want you to do that? Very you know, but he's like 15 going on five months. Yeah. And hugged and. And there's times he just doesn't want to be touched. He's like, just leave me alone. Leave me alone. Give me my space. Yeah. And why are you loud? Because you were you're you're ruining my nap. I mean, he's <laughs> actually been laying down and would look up and give me the, the, the side. I like you are just way too loud. I'm just give you the stare. Yeah, they give you the stare. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, never. Well, yeah. Carl, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, yes. I, I'm sorry, I know we said about 30 minutes and we went up a little bit of yeah, an hour. That's fine. That's fine. But we covered, I, a lot of, um, we covered a lot of very important topics. Yeah. So thank you very much. I hope I was okay. clear, concise. This is my first yes. podcast. No, you did great. No, I will. Yeah, I've, I've done, I've done in that radio, but this is my first podcast on camera. So um, I hope I was clear and um, hope I hope our information was helpful. And, you know, we should get together and do this again. If something else comes up, um, I enjoyed the conversation and um, good luck to you <laughs> in your wellness recovery. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, we'll get, but we'll get there. It's going to take some time. But we'll get there. Uh, Coming before we go, I forgot to ask you if people want to find you on social media, where can they find me? Okay. So um, I can be found on Instagram at jacks out the box j-a-c-k-s-o-u-t-t-h-e-b-o-s b-o-x excuse me like you know jack jack in the box instead of jacks out the box um facebook i have to give you the link to the facebook page but instagram um is probably best um and i have i don't have a youtube channel but i have something up on youtube if they if they go to and um, they run as such as my chronic dizziness, my PPT, PPPD journey, then it'll be CJ all day, uh, 428. Uh, and if they look at that, then they can, and that's what, that was what I, I recorded that early in my journey. And then people have um, submitted comments that I've been able to, to um, respond to. Okay. And then I've just been appointed as um, a new ambassador to um, the Vestibular Disorders Association. So you'll see me again in something or some somewhere saying something. <laughs> so at that time, I'll be able to also have information about how like, people can follow up with me. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Camille. You have a new friend in Canada. And yes, yes. like I said, yes. I do wish you the best in your healing journey. And hopefully we'll do this again soon. Yes, let's do it. Let's, I, I appreciate your... Appreciate you for inviting me, but let's do it again. Awesome. Okay, Camille. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.